networks and um, communities, you see um, many larger collection of labels from different um, uh, projects. Largest one, I will only pick three, but I'm sure there are more and more, and you can see um, a lot of the smaller data sets that has been um, published and made it then public available to all kinds of uh, research topics. And the last one I would like to about the advances in the computing. Not only GPUs, high performance computing resources made all the larger scale uh, geo AI research and production possible. And the collaborative uh, working environment enabled by uh, AWS and Google Collabs that uh, all the researchers can push their prototyped codes made available to other researchers and in definitely accelerate uh, uh, the iterations and advances in machine learning and computer vision in our domain. So uh, I would say those four pillars um, are definitely uh, supporting and actually accelerate a lot of the uh, advances happening in the uh, geospatial uh, data analytics domain. In particular, uh, disaster response, um, the imagery resources right after the post disaster is very critical. And I see also uh, major image, imagery vendors, Maxar, Planets, SR, they, actively engaging in these efforts. Um, you probably also noticed that after a major or uh, catastrophic uh, events, they are very supporting and open uh, the, the imagery to support any kind of post-disaster uh, event analysis. So that's uh, I would like to more focus on the computer vision and machine learning advances to push the uh, disaster response. So those uh, machine learning and computer vision, they definitely provide a viable way to enable rapid and scalable framework to support uh, disaster response, in particular, providing timely damage assessments, uh, extracting uh, actionable knowledge, to support prioritizing to prioritize the rescue and restoration resources. Um, there are many different tasks can be done. Uh, it could be used to uh, assess the impact areas or in more detail assess uh, the structural uh, damage uh, levels or uh, focus on certain areas um, to perform more detailed damage assessments. But the currently most of the machine learning and computer vision frameworks, they are uh, in order to meet a certain criteria of the accuracies. And they, they mostly rely on supervised learning uh, strategies, which made the whole uh, tiling rapid uh, disaster response based on machine learning and computer vision frameworks uh, even more challenging. Because supervised learning frameworks uh, rely, uh, relied on a lot of the label data and in the disaster scenario, disaster response scenario, it is very difficult to acquire enough label data uh, in order to meet that accuracies. So um, in today's uh, topics, I, I pick up four major topics to walk through how we support the disasters from different angles. Um, first, I will introduce the foundational uh, structure database that has been used by uh, federal agencies to support the advanced the disaster preparedness and just to prepare them how to respond right after the disaster hits. And then I will talk about a fully automatic change detection framework to determine the impact area uh, when there are uh, post-disaster imagery available for us to do analysis. Then I will dive into uh, uh, introduce a few shot based learning methods to do a structural damage assessments. 
So future learning method is uh, one branch of the machine learning methods focused on how to maximize, maximize the value of a small amount of label data to do a, a better job on the structural damage assessment. And the last topic I will uh, discuss is uh, uh, introduce our latest work that is the end-to-end -end UAV based framework to support infrastructure demo damage assessment. So the USS structure database, which is the fundamental uh, foundational database that we built uh, in collaboration with the federal emergency uh, management, uh, federal emergency, uh, 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 yes, FEMA, that uh, we build this uh, foundational structural inventory to support them to prepare response in uh, any kind of uh, mitigation uh, efforts. So this project took us uh, five years to build this foundational data there. And the way we see this foundational data there is to provide the most accurate and the current uh, structural uh, characteristics, yeah, including the locations, elevations, and the size, um, and the use of the buildings. Um, this, uh, the reason it took so many, uh, so many years of efforts is it definitely Built upon what half I've mentioned, uh, build the labels and leverage the latest machine learning computer vision advances, coupled with high computer, high computing HPC resources and all available high resolution data. And this is definitely a long game because we wanted to build such a, a foundational data layers that with the consistent um, qualities and extract the uh, critical attributions that made us to the disaster response agencies. So mapping out the structural, uh, the buildings across the United States is just the first step. Uh, we work with uh, the first responders to identify those key attributions that uh, matters the most during the disaster response. And we leverage all kinds of uh, geospatial data sources it could be uh, from existing data layers and also available geospatial, other geospatial data sources. For example, LIDAR is the one key to extract the heights. Um, as you, you already uh, understand that it takes uh, just one year or two years, or uh, it's definitely a long, um, long, long period of project and uh, actually it's still evolving to see what kind of attribution we can add by leveraging uh, available geospatial data and also uh, machine learning methods. And in the past, we have seen uh, several successful events leverage this data. Um, uh, 2018 Cal Fire and 17 uh, Harvey Hurricane and 18 Hawaii Lava Flow and most recently uh, Hurricane Ian. Uh, they have been uh, our uh, our collaborative partners, they have been using this data set to support the disaster response. As long as uh, the impact area can be identified either from uh, simulated uh, methods or there are some predictive uh, capabilities to see, for example, the path of hurricanes, uh, the lava flow, those are can, those, those kind of uh, uh, area, predicted uh, impact area can be identified then uh, overlay with the, the predicted areas, impacted areas, and with the uh, foundational data layers, we can easily identify the potential damaged or impacted population with this foundational data layer. Then the question now comes to how are we going to identify those impact area? Um, so we developed a fully automatic uh, framework as long as we have the pre-event and post-event for us to uh, predict, uh, to identify those uh, impact area right after disaster event hits. So the ideal scenario in this automatic uh, uh, chain detection framework is as long as we have access to pre-event imagery, often 
usually it will be uh, ready for you to use before the disaster hits. And once we have access to the post-event imagery, uh, then these are the two uh, required inputs for uh, this automatic uh, automatic uh, change detection framework. Then we will identify those uh, impacted areas from this framework. And the key technical challenge here is how can we extract uh, enough training samples in a rather automatic way rather than uh, rely on people to do the labeling. So um, we leverage the uh, uh, vegetation indices to extract uh, sampling areas. And uh, in addition to the vegetation indices, we also look for uh, some of the primitive geometric features to identify the potential unchanged areas and use that as the part of our uh, training samples. Then those training samples will be used in this object-based change detection framework. Um, there's a, a consideration to use the object-based change detection framework because uh, in the pre and post event analysis, we often encounter this uh, spatial misalignment issue and using object-based change frame uh, change detection work will mitigate the negative impact from this uh, spatial misalignment uh, issue. Um, so using uh, leveraging the training samples, uh, automatically extracted training samples, piping through the uh, change detection framework, then in the 2011 Joplin tornado example, we can identify those changed areas, the impacted areas. And over there with the structural uh, data layers, the base data layers, we can easily identify how many structures the building has been impacted uh, by the this uh, tornado. So this is the examples. Uh, a detailed look on um, how the pre-tornado event, post-tornado events, and over there with the, our detected impacted area. Um, so this is a rather rapid uh, information extraction from pre and post events. So it's more like give uh, first responders an idea about how large uh, and estimate how many structures, how many people uh, will be impacted by the uh, tornado hit or any kind of uh, natural disaster hit. If we would like to uh, get a more detailed uh, information, for example, the uh, individual structural damage levels, then we will need to do uh, uh, another type of uh, work that is called the damage assessment at a structural a structural level. As I mentioned before, uh, assessing uh, label data is always a challenge. So we propose the workflow that we can prepare ahead. For example, we build um, a general object detection or damage assessment workflow based on available labels. It could be from uh, in-house uh, labels built based on previous disaster events, or uh, we relied on um, publicly available uh, disaster uh, damage assessment label data, which is the one I'm going to talk about. When we have this uh, base model, then we can all, we just need to have a small amount of uh, data, uh, label data from a specific uh, disaster events or uh, specific locations that help us to fine tune this base model. Having this workflow in, in place, uh, one thing is to eliminate having again, abundant labels um, to build the models from scratch. Um, based on past experience, we already know that we have to have a lot of labels to build a specific damage assessment uh, models. So we wanted to um, uh, do a rather faster damage assessment models uh, without relying on, rely on uh, a specific uh, labels from a specific event. So that is our strategy. And to this end, we leverage what we call the few shot learning. 
So the goal of the future of learning is to uh, leverage very small amount of label data from a specific event, for example, a specific uh, tornado uh, uh, or uh, uh, a fire. And the goal of having this uh, framework is to minimize, when we have a very little amount of label data, we still wanted to maximize the value of this uh, small amount of label data. There are uh, three major strategies to achieve that. It could be doing uh, data augmentation or guided model learning in a rather constrained way, rather than searching all possible parameter uh, space. Or we can teach the algorithm uh, focus on a small set of the parameters we only work on to fine tune those parameters. Um, so this is the algorithm strategy is what we uh, leveraged. We use this uh, future reweighting module, try to uh, only focus on small set of the uh, object detection convolutional neural network and using uh, post event labels, a very small amount of labels as I stressed before and try to uh, achieve the comparable uh, object detection method uh, uh, performance as compared to uh, when we have the, a large amount of label data. And we will start with the based damage assessment model, as I mentioned, and this is possible to leverage one of the uh, most uh, I would say it's the largest collection of the damage assessment labels available to public. It uh, This is called XBD datasets. It was from the XView competition. So in these datasets, uh, it covers multiple different type of uh, uh, natural disaster event, pre and post the event. Um, in this proposed framework, we leveraged all possible post event, post disaster building damage assessment labels. And we converted those labels, originally comes as the pixel labeling to polygons based object detection uh, labels. Um, in this case, we only focus on um, if we only have access to the post disaster event and how are we going to do a better job on um, uh, recognizing the damages of the individual uh, given structures. So uh, we assign each building labels from this post event building labels as uh, uh, one of these four classes. And based on the feature reweighting framework, this is the uh, example of that uh, framework can provide the predictions as compared to the labels. So we do see, even though it is it does um, improvement as compared to the standard baseline where we don't do any fuchsia learning, we simply utilize the 30 label images or 100 label images to do the fine tuning. Our proposed framework did improve the results. However, we also see the limitations when we look at uh, only post-event imagery. Uh, for example, I would say uh, destroyed structures. Sometimes it just uh, there. There are there are no any other visual cues to inform the destroyed, completely destroyed structures. So it's really hard for uh, the model to pick up those destroyed structures. And the second limitation we saw is uh, from overhead imagery, uh, it's very difficult to discern the differences between the minor damages versus the major damages. Uh, we utilize the Disney to plot the uh, feature uh, distributions at a different scale from these uh, feature reweighting modules. As you can see, different uh, uh, minor damages are uh, those points uh, heavily overlap with the major damages. It's because from overhead imagery, it's really hard to see uh, the rooftops 
uh, damages at a smaller scale and the as compared to the major damages and sometimes those minor damages can only be seen with a high resolution data or the imagery from other uh, viewing angles for example ground photos may have much more information useful information to determine this is a minor damages because uh, there are some cracks um uh observed of from the uh, given building but those kind of uh, information uh, or visual cues are not visible from overhead imagery so that's a kind of uh, limitation we we saw based on uh, the overhead imagery to uh, support uh, uh, damage assessments at the final scale so that's kind of a uh, motivation we move on to use the uav data uav data definitely offers higher resolution data even though that uh, uh, the coverage may not as large as the overhead imagery but by now we probably have a good sense about where we need to send out uh, uav data to collect the high resolution data um, covering the smaller uh, spatial extent and with the focus on what kind of objects we are going to uh, look at so we developed this end-to-end uh, uh, -end UAV framework uh, to perform utility pole damage assessments. And this is a good example, uh, again, to see to say that the overhead imagery definitely cannot be uh, used in an uh, effective way to assess the damages of the utility poles because uh, such objects are too small and sometimes uh, even with the high resolution data, it's really hard to uh, distinguish is it the utility poles or something else. So that's uh, the that's our motivation to move on to seek uh, uh, a, a UAV based solution um, to do uh, pole uh, utility pole damage assessments. So. Uh, with this uh, UAV edge computing solution, we developed a, a custom airframe that enables our pilots to control uh, the, the flying paths. And with this framework, we can also get the real time information uh, collected by our UAV platform. And we also designed onboard imagery processing coupled with the machine learning deployment capabilities. Um, so we don't need actually uh, to, the our ground station doesn't necessarily need to receive the imagery collected on board. Uh, we care about the detected outputs that are being processed on board. So we only receive the coordinates from uh, the detected uh, damage utility poles in the level of the damages. So by this design, uh, we definitely um, uh, put a consideration because the, there's a, a limited computing resources and limited uh, bandwidth to transmit the information to the ground. Um, and the model we used, the machine learning model, uh, we used is uh, based on YOLO because when we were uh, when we uh, looking for solutions to see what would be the best available when we deploy the model on the ages age devices there's a balance we need to care about uh, is the accuracies and also the speed uh, processing speed that uh, 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 given the limited uh, restrained computing resources available on the edge. So YOLO is the one we've selected and we performed several uh, evaluations and based on the model sizes. So for example, uh, the larger models definitely give us the better results. However, uh, you see that the processing speed with the YOLO V5 large model take to takes about uh, almost double processing time. And the processing time, the inference speed definitely differ from device uh, available computing devices available on age. So it's a kind of a case by case uh, scenario and depending, depending on the re resolution that the camera can collect. So it's a, a trade off um, 
pause during this work. So pick the the model not only give us the the highest accuracy, also the best uh, inferencing uh, speed, uh, giving a uh, uh, computing resources. So this is the uh, example that we tested our end-to-end -end framework in 2021 Ida hurricane to detect the uh, uh, utility poles to see if they are poles undamaged or the dump poles due to the hurricane. Um, the limitation or lesson learned we from uh, lesson learned from this exercise is that uh, again other modality of uh, data might be useful to help us to improve the accuracies. For example, height information, perhaps this is one thing we can look into from other sensors, LIDAR, for example, because uh, from visual, the from the images co we collected, um, a lot of trees, they look exactly just like those down poles. And that's one of the major false, false positives uh, errors we observe during this uh, exercise. Um, the last thing I wanted to um, uh, touch a little bit is um, some of the protocol considerations when we utilize advanced the geo AI for disaster response. Um, several uh, experiences in the past taught us to work with uh, local responders or the users more, because uh, sometimes the considerations from machine learning, computer vision researchers, the considerations are definitely the same as the uh, local responders. For example, we, uh, as the machine learning practitioners or uh, imagery specialists, we care about high, highest accuracy possible. But for local responders, they care about uh, how fast a given um, a rough solutions and it could be the eighty or eighty percent solution can be given within the first uh, twenty four hours of time. So this kind of uh, expectation should be aligned because the solution based on uh, geo AI should be uh, crafted based on that kind of agreement between the users and uh, the machine learning uh, researchers. And oftentimes I also see that uh, we tend to use a very complex models, which means uh, it's really hard to interpret the results to the local users. And that's kind of uh, one thing we observe that they usually ask uh, very hard questions like, why these models give uh, these predictions and the predictions are wrong. Um, they, uh, the, the mistakes are often picked up more often than does the corrected uh, uh, predictions. And because it's, uh, there's uh, uh, consequences when we look at uh, using or deploying or adopting AI and Apple models to support the disaster response. So that's kind of uh, um, challenges I saw in the past uh, when we work with the uh, local responders or partitioners to adapt the data and mapable solutions. Um, there are still other remaining challenges I haven't talked about. I mostly focus on how we can address uh, scaling and generalization uh, aspects of uh, using GeoAI for disaster response. And there, uh, is uh, trending research directions that I encourage all of you to think about the how we can leverage multimodality geospatial data to further enable the real time uh, situational awareness rather than uh, it could be the disaster response or uh, providing actionable information in any sense to promote this uh, situational awareness. That's definitely one thing. I see it's uh, beneficial to further push the GeoAI for disaster response. And uh, I mentioned uh, how to uh, improve. Uh, uh, there's a uh, ongoing challenges uh, like lack of trust. Um, the last thing, is, the last challenge I would say it's a privacy issue. Um, a lot of the data we cannot just use because of the privacy concern. There are some PII information, for example, on the ground photos, and there has to be uh, uh, 
a policy in place to inform how uh, machine learning communities or or uh, remote sensing community how we can leverage those information, a rich information to help with the disaster response while uh, we are uh, definitely care about the privacy issue uh, that won't cause any uh, challenges when we adapt this uh, AI and mapable solutions. Um, so there's a also ongoing work that we try to push. It's uh, having a human in the loop. I'm sure many of you also look into that direction. I definitely see the benefits having human in the loop in supporting disaster response because uh, it provides a venue to uh, understand the model when uh, you are part of the model improvements as the users, you will put more confidence on those, uh, uh, the final product. And also it offers a, a rather convenient way to do the labeling. For example, a few shot learning uh, requires a small amount of the label data, then human in a loop mechanism definitely can help it can be used in combination with that. Just label a few small amount of labels and can help uh, boost the model performance. So that's uh, my final uh, point to uh, look at uh, how to advance further in the GOI uh, disaster response. I'm gonna stop here and I will take any questions you might have. Um, for this work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lexi, for your nice presentation. We have learned a lot about the, uh, how we are going to deal with the disaster using the machine learnings. So please ask your question using the chat box, or you can also uh, turn uh, on your microphone and to ask the questions to our speaker, Dr. Lexi Yang, if you have any question. So I actually... Yeah, somebody is, I, I think, trying to ask a question. Nida, Kayum, are you asking? Are you trying to ask a question? I don't know, I guess. Anyone? You can just type the questions to chat box and then you can read them. But I would like to have a question for you. And uh, I mean, this is a very good job because I mean, it, it's, especially this topic, the disaster assessment, it's already a very difficult research area because it involves many diversity, like you said in your presentation, in terms of data type, the multimodality in geospatial data, disaster type. And it also depends on the, the geographic location where the uh, disaster happens. And also you mentioned the, the, dam the assessment of the damage types, like minor damage and also the major damage. So it includes many diversity. So when it comes to the generalization of the, the, the framework, what would you say about that? I mean, do you think, is it possible to generate a model that we can also use this model for assessment of the damage types in another location? So what would you say about that, Lexi? Yeah, that's a that's great um, point question. Uh, let me put down this particular one. Um, so we did, uh, I think this is probably is a good example to answer your question. We did uh, several iterations on how we can leverage the XPD data sets. Like I mentioned, this data sets covers, um, has a, mm, the, the label, uh, damage label uh, from different type of disasters. And even though, uh, we care about these four types of damages. For example, the the destroyed um, the destroyed damages from hurricane events versus destroyed the labels from say a flooding event. They are very different. So that's why we, like, based on our uh, initial explorations. Um, even we can build a general uh, damage assessment model ca capturing the four major categories. It is really challenging to just apply that general model to a specific event. So that's why we 
came up this solution that uh, we need to leverage small amount of label data describing the uh, domain shifting happened between uh, the base damage assessment model and a specific event. Because that's where I see the small amount of the label data can capture uh, or to mitigate the domain shifting uh, between these two events. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the, the flooding events versus the hurricane events, the differences mm -hmm. in major damage and minor damage. Because if you if you can look at the labels just from different events, you will see uh, visually they are definitely exactly. not the same type of the classes. Yeah, All right. Thanks, Lexi. So we have a couple of questions on the chat box. If you like, you can read the questions and then answer. There's one coming from Michael Cho. You are able to see the chat box, right? Yes. Uh, how would you you consider mitigating hydro? Would you please uh, uh, read a lot, Alexis? Uh, like yes. So I have a question from Michael Shaw. Mm -hmm. uh, his question is: uh, How would I consider mitigating against the uh, heterogeneous or differences between images seems to assure the accuracy of the assessment to build trust? in the machine learning process. Um, so I, I'm going to break my answer into two part, parts. One, the first part is how we, uh, the strategy we need to take to perform um, harmonizing different type of data sets. So obviously, this is not trivial task given the different resolutions and the spatial misalignment issues and also uh, uh, the, the fundamental characteristic differences in their data characteristics to how to uh, fuse those together and this is more like it is not trivial and very challenging I would say and uh, I know there's an ongoing work, try to uh, build a foundational models that us, our group try to push. And I know some of the other uh, groups, um, there are some efforts try to build that kind of uh, models to address the heterogeneous and differences between the images or different types of sources. And I would imagine that in this process, uh, the conversation will happen based uh, from different experts, and those collective thoughts were put into um, shaping how to develop the framework that achieved the maximized accuracies. Um, then building a trust, it is it is a process that requires not only machine learning process uh, researchers aspects, and um, I think uh, especially the imagery scientists, they would uh, definitely have uh, space to share how they want to share uh, how to build these uh, foundational models uh, using different type of uh, uh, data sets. So, I don't have a solid answer to answer the second question, how to build the trust in the machine learning process, but uh, based on what I have uh, experienced and what I have learned, um, engaging as many as uh, people in the communities, either from uh, imagery, Im image scientists, the machine learning researchers, and the users, uh, when their thoughts has been considered in this process, that naturally will increase the trust in any kind of AI and map uh, solutions. There is another question. Is FEMA ground truth public, publicly accessible? FEMA ground truth? Yes. Okay. yes. Mm -hmm. um, they are available to public. Mm -hmm. I will try to get a link to you. Um, so this ground truth database is built um, uh, several years of the uh, ground ground level assessment. So it's definitely useful if um, researchers want to leverage that database. Mm -hmm. I have also a couple of que questions that directly sent me. So I would like to read uh, these questions for you, Lexi. 
can flood expenses uh, be simulated with help of AI and machine learning? Can you suggest some works paper, papers, I guess, using SAR or N8 models or hydrological models works has been done as of now, anything beyond? So it's kind of a complicated question. Yeah. So it's, uh, is, can, go ahead. Yeah. Can flood expense, expenses be simulated with help of AI and uh, machine learning? Can you suggest some uh, papers? You mean using SAR or yeah. SAR data specific? Or, yeah, or N8 models or hydro, hydrological models. Works have been done as of now. Anything beyond? Um, SAR is one data source, uh, in particular, very useful as to determine the uh the what would you call the damages damage levels it has been done in several works and one the benefits of using SAR in particular for damage assessment is we don't we don't have the issues of the cloud cover, uh, which is something we often yeah. encounter when we look at the uh, article-based imagery analytics solutions for damage assessment. So uh, that's one thing I saw SAR can be useful. And I believe there has been several efforts try to combine SAR and optical imagery as the multimodality framework to do damage assessment recently. Um, yeah. I think, uh, and also SAR, I believe there is so one public data uh, label available to anyone who are interested. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, studies using SAR data as it uh, is able to, you know, cover the, the uh, geographical location in, in any weather conditions. So. There are a lot of papers, uh, yes, using the SAR. Yeah. So we have another question. We have a couple of questions. Let's read them. So there is another one. Have you tried some other deep learning pipelines, such as semi-supervised, weekly supervised, or self-supervised learning to address the data scarcity issue in disaster damage monitoring? What are your uh, prospects on these pipelines? Sorry. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say our team has um, investigate it significantly in that those methods but yes we look into uh semi-supervised or weekly supervised um self-supervised is one thing we look into but not for our damage assessment aspect so semi-supervised way uh or weekly supervised we had a, a dumb uh similar applications uh in a way that we were it's more like a from a human in the loop aspect um we provide the pre uh, predictions and then we kind of uh, providing uh well, how can say it? a pre-built model and we utilize the adversarial learning try to improve um the accuracies giving a post-event disaster imagery when we have the no label data available so uh, that's that's we consider the scenario when we do not have any labels at all from uh, new data sets, for example, post event uh, imagery. And we didn't we didn't talk about that in this talk just because uh, I wanted to more focus on the operational uh, examples we try to push. And in operational side, there's a level of uh, um, asked about the accuracies. And even though we have seen the semi-supervised, weekly supervised, they have uh, um, some improvements. Uh, it was not as good as what we have asked for. But I'm sure, um, for example, uh, future learning is one thing we uh, we are actively looking to may fo uh, forcing may push that a little bit more in the future. I hope that answer uh, Yong Jen's question, or at least provide some pointers on what where we are right now. Okay, 
Thank you. Another question the about the structures uh, that you have uh, shown us in the images are very well organized. How the models will perform on a busy area? Does the XBD data set covers the dense areas or unplanned land use areas? So that's what I'm also wondering to hear. Uh, from, oh, yes. Busy area, I would assume it's a heavily populated area that would that's my and, and buildings like you know there's no organizations the, the the buildings are not divided by the roads they are next to each other and probably uh, is talking about that yes i i see that could be a um, very challenging problem um yeah, it it's even it's or it's a already difficult problem to uh distinguish those uh uh individual Buildings, buildings, I guess, yeah. yeah. Uh, for post disaster events, and yes, that's going to be a uh, challenge. Uh, I would say though, um, mm, the XBD dataset does not necessarily contain those labels you are looking for. Uh, if there are very be small amount of uh, labels mm -hmm. yes um but I'm i think there are other uh smaller scale of uh, label data made available to support this effort um so perhaps that's something we can look into mm -hmm. okay Thank you. Another question from uh, Rashad Shine. Uh, thank you for your insi in, in, insightful talk, Dr. Yang. So my question is with regards to the LiDAR-based pole detection problem. Usually LiDAR data is having very less points belonging to the poles as compared to the other classes such as ground or vegetation. Are there any special methods to deal with this issue? Yes, this is some point. I would say the uh, LiDAR data has several benefits, uh, but it's very expensive. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's very expensive. However, in United States, I cannot say other regions, but in, in United States, um, I am some of in other areas, I believe. LiDAR data sets, it's actually more available as to the pre-disaster data sets, not exactly pre, just before the disaster, more like uh, there's a way to build the pre-event uh, baseline, baseline data sets, uh, very similar to the foundational data there I have mentioned. So that might be one thing we can, uh, we can look at, utilize as much as possible with uh, insisting LIDAR data. And even with uh, post-event LIDAR data, um, those data are being collected uh, in a rather smaller scale. Uh, so I would, I think it's more like when we have more data, then we know exactly how we're going to address the challenge. Yeah. And there's a MIT, uh, I think it's a header research group. They are investigating in getting how to utilize the post event LIDAR data to do damage assessments. From what I can see, their results, uh, they are pretty good. Um, and this is purely ba ba uh, based on post event LIDAR data. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question again about the LIDAR data, I guess. When talking about damage areas, minor, major, complete destruction, classification, I believe LiDAR data will help refine the results of the image classification, but the problem with LiDAR data is there are very less pre-disaster data sets available. How should we deal with this challenge? Uh, I think uh, maybe my response before kind of uh, offer yeah. some of the directions. Yeah, um, yeah that's yeah. Right. Let me... Yeah. Okay, yeah. you can just skip this question. You already covered this one. So, yeah. Oh, okay, how do you collect sample data using few shot learning model without human labeling? Uh, say again. You might. 
How, how do we collect? Uh, how do you collect sample data using few shot learning model without human labeling? I see. So the few shot learning that we in my presentation that was uh, based on uh, randomly selected, but uh, we are looking to how to combine a human in the loop um, to produce those most uncertain labels to see if those small set of uh, potentially most useful uh, images can be labeled in combination of the future learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we are done with the questions, with the technical questions. Now, uh, I think it's our turn uh, to, uh, you know, ask you some uh, non-technical questions. Uh, before doing that, uh, I would like to again thank you very much for your nice presentation. We had a lot of participants here. I would like to also thank uh, all of them uh, for attending this great webinar. So, uh yes uh, i would like to ask these non-technical questions uh, especially to discuss some of the aspects uh, related to being a woman in science so my first question is uh, what inspired you to pursue a career in science which is a very general question but that might be very helpful uh, for the other uh, female researchers thank you for the question i think um the mission I'm supporting and seeing how my work, my team's work collectively um, address a very small part of the challenges we are facing, for example, disaster response, or in general, understanding the population changes at a larger scale, those kind of, uh, uh, even I'm, I'm only contributing small, uh, small efforts toward these uh, bigger problems, those when i recognize those works has been contributing some parts it's kind of rewarding and definitely motivate motivating uh, factors for us to pursue how how i can advance the science in support um, uh, addressing mm -hmm. those particle issues yeah okay great so how about uh the the role models uh do you think uh i mean uh, having a role models are important in science so is there anyone in that sense is there anyone who inspires you uh, in academic career yeah definitely um so i came in as a phd student and i have a pleasure to work with um, many esteemed researchers um and of course I, I have I have so many different uh, challenges and oftentimes I seek a different opinions. Uh, I, I seek I talk to different people to offer me the opinions. But I wanted to uh, mention three names that had uh, a significant impact in my career path. Uh, those happen to be females, which is wonderful, excellent experiences to me. Uh, it's kind of also motivating how I can give back to this community. Um, so my PhD advisor, Melba Crawford, mm -hmm. she definitely uh, had a significant impact on how she uh, helped me understand how uh, regular research looked like and how we can make the contributions to uh, uh, larger communities while we pursue uh, the excellence in, in, science, uh, in, in science. And also, um, uh, when I start uh, 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 in my career transition from a PhD student postdoc to a uh, new working environment, uh, Oak Ridge National, National Laboratory, which is very different from traditional academia, yeah. um, I was paired to a mentor, uh, Diane Evans from GIS's uh, Women in Science uh, Mentoring Program. So I'm very grateful that I have uh, Diane Evans as my mentor while I was navigating um, my career, my new career at the uh, uh, government uh, national laboratory kind of setting. So their, uh, her views and her advice on how I can, I should uh, address the, the issue, not the new challenges I faced during that time, during this uh, career transition, that's uh, definitely helped me uh, boosting my confidence on how 
cannot be a successful scientist in this domain. And the third one, uh, a female. You got, the, you got the second one from the uh, mentorship program. Uh, yes. Yeah, so right. so that is a, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very recently, I have uh, seen an announcement about that. Uh, I would like to also uh, say this here because you, you see the, you know, uh, the, the effect of the uh, having a mentorship uh by Lexi so please also take a look at that uh, that would be very helpful yeah please go ahead sorry for interrupting but uh, uh, yeah I mean yes that's a uh I think I joined like uh, the first the first round of the mentor a uh, mentoring program and it was so uh useful to me and because sometimes I feel very uh like I don't know what I was doing at that time and some of the issues that uh um, I don't know how to address, and uh, this program paired me with the uh, a senior researchers who share the similar background. For example, I'm looking for someone who work in government settings or uh, national laboratory mm -hmm. settings, and um, Diane was the one assigned to me, and we had a great time working together. So I definitely uh, appreciate that opportunity. So I also encourage everyone to uh, look for that kind of information. Sure. And the third one is Dr. Amy Rose. Uh, Amy has been uh, she she was she is my uh, more like a project manager PIs, and I worked with her for six years. I learned a lot from her, more like uh, how 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 a researcher can be creative, and also uh, uh, have a vision how to lead a, a larger scale research project that are benefiting different communities. So you can imagine as a postdoc when I started my career at Oak Ridge and having seen her leading different successful projects and being a role model to me. And it's also, um, she's always available for me uh, whenever I have any kind of questions. I think one of the key thing I learned from these three role models is um, you have to, the one to initiate uh, the conversations because uh, you are unique and the problem you are facing are unique and only you can do uh, you know who you can seek for help and and the three role models I mentioned they have been very open to me offering opinions and shaping up uh, to kind of very encourage mentally to be uh, uh, try to be a, a successful of scientists yeah yeah i mean having a, a mentor a women mentor makes a really great difference right so that's what we have seen here so i would like to also uh, ask you uh, the i mean another question about so i mean being a woman is really so difficult and you also shared us uh, your experience shared your experience with us but so how about being a mother a mother uh, so, because I know you are a mother as well, so things change a lot. Uh, so, could you also, you know, uh, share your experience with us and, you know, recommendation or, you know, any challenges <laughs> you face? Uh, yeah, the, uh, I know I am also the mother, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I think the roles I'm playing, they, they are not conflicting in a way that um, I would definitely believe the saying that you can have it all. But you do have uh, recognize the difficult, the the real, the fact that you have only twenty four hours a day, so you have to prioritize uh, according to the level that that you are comfortable with. So that means, um, uh, so you have to um, craft your own path. Um, you can have all, you can have all, but not at the same time. And I heard the interesting. Uh, analogy often times that uh, juggling different roles, for example, being a project manager, a mother, a scientist is like a juggling different balls. And you have to decide which balls you are comfortable with just to let it go, drop on the floor and waiting for another bounce so that uh, whenever you are comfortable to catch that ball again. So sometimes mm -hmm. you have to make that decision that uh, at the the comfortable level you 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 agree with. Um, 
it's it's a different scenario for anyone and i i recently also heard uh, one of our senior uh leaders female leaders it's a being a woman scientist and mother or it's a great thing because it's a true demonstration that uh you can manage all because imagine that you have to juggle different balls a house and a school school suddenly closed today uh kids are sick today so you're <laughs> naturally uh cultivating the ability to juggle different um important things at the same time yeah multitasking but, yeah right <laughs> so it's it's kind of a, uh you will be fine and you will be doing you will do great as a model as a scientist as long as you have a clear path on when and how you're going to achieve and again having having a, a mentor uh to encourage you uh to answer the questions you have that's um definitely very helpful and i would also add that um, i work with uh, several female colleagues and at Oak Ridge, we have this uh, Women Alliance Council. It's a, a place for women to talk about and how and also shape up the directions that can help the a workplace toward more inclusive place. So that's also one thing I found is very useful to me. Thank you. Great. I mean, uh, personally, I've also learned a lot from this. Uh, two parts of the webinar. The first part was the you know technical, non-technical, both of uh, them were great. Thank you again. So if you got, I'm uh, the participants, if you have any question, please ask the question. If you don't have, I would like to thank again to Dr. Lexi Yang uh, for contributing uh, our webinar series. So we are planning to have the second, the third and the fourth. So we will see, we will organize it and we will let you know about our from our uh, social media accounts. So thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, there are people are thinking, uh, they are saying thank you to you on the chat box. Uh, so thank you, Lexi. Uh, so you uh, devoted your valuable time to us in your busy schedule. Thanks again. <laughs> thank you, Gautam, and thank you. It was also very really nice to see you. I mean, yeah. personally, yeah, I would like to also say that it has been a long time. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, thank Hafiz. Okay, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks.